at Rubber Band, we empower each other through positivity, kindness, and practical advice. Join a community of thousands of peers who understand the unique challenges you face. Rubber Band, company agnostic, low ego, high empathy, always supportive. Are you tired of spending endless hours on traditional hiring methods? Fairgo.ai is here to revolutionize the way you conduct interviews. Our platform allows for real-time AI interviewing, giving you the flexibility to connect with candidates anytime, anywhere. By automating the matching process, we eliminate the need for manual input, saving you time and effort. And the best part? We're committed to promoting a fair and unbiased interview process by removing identifying information. Embrace the future of hiring with Fairgo.ai today so you never miss another great candidate. And we are live. Welcome, listeners, to today's episode of the Rubber Band Podcast, where I'm joined by guest Lee Marjoram. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I live and work on, the Wadawarrung and Jaja Warring people. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waterways. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I would like to extend this to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Welcome to the podcast. Lee, how are you? Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much for having me on today as well. Oh, I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, don't be silly. I appreciate you joining me. I can't wait to have a chat and learn all about your career and yeah, all your yeah. little nuggets of wisdom for the audience. Yeah, you had a good day, good week? Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's, um, yeah, busy. Busy as always, right? There's always things to be doing, especially in the oh, world of recruitment, as we know. So, oh, you know, yeah. right? We never stop. We're on the hamster wheel 24 7. That's, that's yeah. the career we chose, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and are you based in your? Are you based in Melbourne by memory? Where are you? No, where are I'm you Sydney. Based? I'm Sydney. Oh, you're Sydney, fab. Yeah, fab yeah. Whereabouts? Yeah. So, in, as you can tell from my accent, English as um, a lot of recruiters <laughs> are. But I've been, I've been, I've been in Australia now for eight years, so so quite a while. Excellent. Um, loved every second. We I live out in the Hills District now. Moved away from the city as well. Moved away from the um, the Bondi bubble and the recruitment hotspots. <laughs> and, um, more to suburbia um yeah we've just um welcomed our first child she's only seven weeks old so oh congrats yeah. man it's nice amazing. to be out here and have a bit more space you see so oh yeah. that, that's such great news what's her name uh, anderson andy andy how brilliant yeah. and you'll get to my age mate what well, what happens right you you leave the city i lived in the city for a number of years you go a little bit suburban you start moving out and then you end up in the country so you know exactly you, you, you will you'll be like me you'll be in the blue mountains or somewhere like that i don't know what, what would be considered country in sydney these days but yeah <laughs> yeah it's expanding isn't it but um yeah my partner's um, family is all from wilberforce and the windsor area and that kind of areas so we're oh, always nice. out there and I know that she'd be very keen to move out there. So maybe in the future, we'll see. We'll see how we go. Windsor area. It always it reminds me of growing up watching a country practice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Watford Valley. That's where that's Windsor, isn't it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a nice little town, actually. It's very it historic. It's lovely. It's very lovely. Well, historic. Let's kick off. I think with, with these episodes, Lee, I really want to hear... Yeah, about you. So let's go back. Yeah. I know you you mentioned you grew up in the the UK. So tell me about yes. your childhood and tell me about growing up and going to school and all of those sort of things. Where tell tell me all about you, mate. Um, cool. That's a big question, isn't it? There's a lot yeah. to go through there. I think you know <laughs> I, I've I've always been I've always been a communicator. I've always been a a little bit of an extrovert, I suppose. And um, I've always been someone who's liked to be around people, have connections do that sort of thing that's just always been part of my life and I think that you know when I got into the later years of school I with all honesty I, I couldn't wait to get out and do what I wanted to do rather than the subjects that were there and you know I kind of had to do at the time um which took me into um college where I went and actually I did mechatronics so mechanical oh, electronic wow. yeah mechanical electronic and embedded software as well um so I trained in that for a few years really Jeez, enjoyed so it you're a bright spark. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so you've got you've got a, a very mathematical mind. Do you think? Uh, well, I would. Yeah, math was a huge part of it. Actually, absolutely huge part of it. Um, it was probably the bit that I least enjoyed, but it's, it's it's you know fundamental to what it is. So, you know, that's what you have to do. I mean, I just love taking things apart and putting them back together. And that's how I've always, right. you know, my whole life. I mean, even my house here, you know, everything's controlled by Google. Um, you know, it, 
you know, I've, I've always been around technology. I've always loved technology. So um, doing that, I suppose, um, you know, when I when I did that in education, it was it was great for me because, you know, I really enjoyed it. But I, I felt like so I'd gone too far. So when I when I came to the end of um, college, I was always I was already on a working path and I was going down this other working path, which I was actually really enjoying as well, which was dealing with people, you know, so yeah. I went into more kind of sales roles. So first one was, um, oh, there was a few, but first ones were more like, you know, um, I suppose the equivalent of like JB Hi-Fi, but in the UK, you know, like electrical sales, that kind of thing, really enjoyed the environment, loved enjoying uh, work with people, all that kind of stuff, and kind of fell more into this sales kind of, um, I suppose, aspect of my life. And um, I then went on to do um so this is while I was still at college I then went on to do all kinds of different sales so I worked in the automotive trade for a bit I um I was self-employed self-employed selling solar panels which in the UK is not an easy sell um, when uh, much, but, um <laughs> yeah exactly where, where right are you from, by the way what part of the UK are you from East Anglia so um Suffolk yeah. so oh, yeah. it's in between in between Ipswich and Cambridge is right. where I'm yeah. probably about about an hour and a bit away from London Okay. Yeah. So there's not a lot of sun, right? Selling solar panels. How did you, how did you manage that? Uh, well, they was, and, and they weren't like the solar panels you get over here either. They were just for, they were basically tubes that um, heated up under the sun and it condensed that energy and then um, pipes would go through it and it would heat up water. So all it would do is your hot water tank. It wouldn't do anything else, you know, right. but um, there was a market for them. And especially, you know, for the for the rare people who did have swimming pools back in the UK, that was you know one of the markets that you did have for that as well to heat the swimming pools and stuff. So there, there was definitely a market, but it definitely wasn't um, an easy sales job, and it wasn't a sales job that I, I think a lot of people would think of doing or, or did do. Um, but it taught me a lot around um, connections, relationship building, uh, being persistent, all of these different I suppose attributes which um, I love doing, and, and like I say. I've, I, I really enjoyed that side of things. So then I, I came out the um, the back of um, doing my education um, in mechatronics, and I was like, where do I go from here? You know, mm. do I go into a, a junior role within that, or do I go out and do what I'm doing, which I'm actually pretty good at, and earn some money um, and enjoy that as well? So I decided to go down that path. Um, so I carried on doing the sales or side of stuff, and I suppose where recruitment kind of come into the picture was. Um, I actually, funnily enough, um, so it was a, um, I met another salesperson who had actually gone into recruitment and fa- actually they failed at recruitment. They, they went into it for a bit and then didn't even work <laughs> out for them. But the, at the right. time when I met them, I met them and I remember I met him just walking past and I said, and he goes, oh, you should look into recruitment. And I didn't know what it was at the time. And he goes, I'm driving in this, I've, dri- I've just bought a Porsche and, you know, all of this. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I was like, and I thought about it more and I didn't really understand it. Um, but I was like, I, it kind of tweaked my interest enough to think, right, OK, let's have a little look into that. So I um, found a recruitment company that did engineering, oh, so cool. IT and engineering. Okay. And and I thought this is a great mix of kind of the skills that I love in the consulting field, but also some of the educational background that I've had as well. Um, and um yeah, and then I was just persistent with that as well. I got turned down for them by them a few times because I didn't have a, um, I hadn't completed a degree at that point, and they wanted a degree. What um, kind of degree did they want? See, I find that crazy. Like, yeah, I do that, as well. Is that, yeah, is that a thing in the UK? Is that a common thing where you need to have still, a university degree? It is, and I, I think in some companies, probably still a thing over here as well. But it's definitely more in the oh, UK. Yeah. They would, um, yeah, I found it weird because um, you know when I and I'll come on to this later, but when I actually became sort of a team leader um, within recruitment there, I was hiring for people for my team and I had to hire people with degrees and I didn't have one because I never completed wow. it. You know, so um, it was a um, it was an interesting dynamic. But um, I suppose there's some reasons behind it. But any degree, I mean, my friend um, Tim, he's actually in Australia and he works in recruitment as well. He's got a, a degree in history. Um, yeah, right. And that was enough to get him through the door in recruitment, you see. So, so you know, interesting. I just, see, yeah, I just, yeah. I, I reflect on that. I mean, I'm a, I, I did a trade and I didn't, you know, like everyone's going to laugh because I'm, I'm, you know, campus Christmas. Like, I mean, my trade was floristry, right? So I, um, okay. I deferred uni and then I ended up doing a TAFE course and that was what, yep. what I got credited in. And yep, yep. I've never been asked for a degree. 
in in no. my roles. It's never come no. up for me, but it's really interesting that it's still a thing. Well, I'm talking eight years ago. I mean, I haven't obviously been over there for eight years, so I don't know. But when I was leaving, it was, and I'd I'd be surprised. I think a lot of companies still do ask for it. Yeah, I mean, I understand over here because if you're trying to sponsor someone, um, obviously, if you've got a degree, they need to have less experience. Oh, if it's a related oh. degree, but that's related. Yeah. And in the UK, they were just after any. So, yeah, right. But yeah. So, well, um, yeah. So you went into that agency. You tried a few times. How, how did it? When, when did it? When did it happen? When did you first start your recruitment career? And how did that all come about? Well, I went in. Um, I had a conversation with them. They said we'd be in contact. They knocked me back and then said stay in contact though. And I did. Yeah. And I just harassed them via email. Um, <laughs> followed up when I said I was going to do it. Um, and they gave me more opportunities. And then I remember that um, ultimately they gave me this um, opportunity. They said, right, well, pitch to us what you would do when you come into recruitment. And I, again, knew recruitment from an outside, but I didn't understand recruitment fully. I knew what I was supposed to be doing, placing people in jobs. But I didn't know much more than that about process or how it works or how you got on new customers or how you interacted with them or what that process would be or anything. So I um, put together this presentation and this was years ago when I first, so this was a long, long time ago. And I remember I had a really old iPhone, one of the first iPhones and a really old iPad and I managed to get them to work to each other so I could do the slides on my phone and it would slide across and change the oh, slides nice. on the iPad. Um, and I did this presentation. I don't know if it was right, um, but they loved it. And um, I, that's when I got the opportunity. Um, so it was persistence, really, that, that got me into it. But it's something that I really wanted to do. And I, I really, truly believed, and I still do believe, that it's a good mix of my skills. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, I, the other route that I probably could have gone into software sales or something like that, mm. or more into a consultancy field. But, um, no, I love recruitment. And that's, you know, that's it was a great mix of my skills. And that's kind of, yeah, so that's, that's so how really- I got- that's so interesting. When you jumped in, I suppose, as a rookie recruiter with, with a really strong sales background and your, yeah. your mechanics degree, what what was the reality? I mean, you mentioned, you know, in your mind it was around finding roles for people, right? And that's why we all get into it. We feel that that's yeah. going to be incredibly satisfying, which, which don't get me wrong, it is. But what yeah. was the reality of being a rookie recruiter? Like what, what, what surprised you when you actually jumped in and hit the tools? Well, they, they played me to my strengths so when I was in there. Um, so I, I didn't go in as a well, – I, I just went in straight as a recruitment consultant, actually, oh, wow. for as well. So they just gave me a desk and said, kind of get on to it. I'll get on with it. Um, but the um, I had some really good managers around me. And when, when I say they played me to the strengths, over the course of a few years there, um, what they would do is put me on a market or on an area or on a skill set and then use me to um, – open up new clients, build relationships, that kind of thing. And then I'd open a market to a certain point and then I'd be moved to a different one and then someone else would go in. And looking back on it now, I mean, you'd be like, oh, that, you know, well, that that, that's kind of annoying because it takes you two years probably to get more stability in your role and what you're doing. Back at the time, I mean, I was just happy for the opportunity. So I was happy to be doing Mm. that. Um, And it gave me, again, it gave me a lot of... um, knowledge and skills on how clients like to work but also different technologies um you know with that as well different types of businesses and organizations um a lot of it a lot of what we're doing nearly all of what i was doing was engineering manufacturing at that time right. which fell okay. fell quite well with um the mechatronics degree so electrical engineering so anything from the first ever um robot lawnmowers to cars, fuel injectors, yeah. aerospace, yeah. plane seats, anything really. All these different big manufacturing facilities that were, you know, all over um, East Anglia. How, inter- how interesting. And, you know, at some point we, and, you know, you mentioned a, a, a friend of yours that talked to you about recruitment and it didn't, wasn't quite the right mm. career path for mm. them in the end. Mm. Like at what point did you go, do you know what, I, I think this is the career for me. I think this is working and I think I can take this somewhere. When, when did that happen? I think there was a few times, well, there definitely was a few times in the first year um, where it, I was kind of like, maybe I'll just go back to what I was doing before because it's, yeah. it's overwhelming. There's so many mm-hmm. different parts to recruitment 
and there's obviously the highs and the lows. And when you're just learning a trade and there's, you know, so many different objections or things will happen or you'll speak to a client and a client will pull a role or a candidate will then move to another country or, you know, there's so many different things that could potentially happen. Um, it was kind of getting your head around all of that and how that all kind of fits together. So I suppose coming into it, I hoped that it would be the career because I didn't see the the roles that I was doing within sales as being as much of a career, although it could be because ultimately the thing with a lot of sales jobs is if you go into management positions, which is ultimately what I wanted to do, a lot of the time you earn less than if you're a good salesman. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing. And, you know, it's, yeah, so I, I didn't see sales to, as a career, but I knew that I wanted to do something with people and consulting and it, coming into it, I hoped that it was going to be a career, um, but it probably was after the first year when I really kind of got my head around it and I was like, right, I'm comfortable now where I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And cool. Well. Yeah. What's, what's harder to sell a person or a solar panel in England? Well, I'm <laughs> in England or in general, I think, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's both it's very different. And I, I would, you know, I will say that, and I suppose we'll probably touch on this maybe later anyway, but obviously I, recruitment is a consulting role, but aspects of it are sales. You know, there's mm. a lot of that within it. You know, you have to sell the opportunity in the right way to get people that are interested in it. There's all kinds of sales at, 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 um, um, parts to recruitment. And I think, you know, if you really break it down, recruitment is probably the hardest form of sales that you could do because if you were selling a house or if you were selling a person, you control one side of the pro the process. The house can't say no, mm -hmm. you know, the, the car can't say no or whatever that asset is. It can't say no. So you control one side of the process, which is making sure that the customer's happy and getting what they want. And ultimately if they want the product then the products there, mm -hmm. whereas within recruitment, you've got two concurrent processes going along. You've got a client, who have their own process, which uh, a, a lot of the time will need help and guidance on that, that, and you know, that um, down that kind of route. And then on the other side, you've got the candidate, which can do the same thing. So it's like running two different sales consultative processes at the same time, which makes it a lot more complicated and probably a lot more difficult than any other form of, you know, sales or consulting out there. I would totally. say. Totally. Because you, you you don't have anything tangible, right? Like, I mean, you've you've got two people that need to make a decision that you can influence either side. Mm -hmm. but at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it's out of your control. You don't have something yeah. that you can say, "Hey, you need this." Yeah, and, exactly. and it exists, and yeah, yeah. It, and it doesn't decide whether it needs, you know, what it no. is, right? Like, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's, it's there. It's physical. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's fascinating. And and I think the sales component never goes away. I think no. a good internal recruiter has that really strong sales mindset as well, because, yeah. you know, it's, it's not operational and there's so much, uh, so much influence involved because you've got those two parties that don't necessarily yeah. know they need yeah. each other yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. until you match them. And and, mm. and you get that buy in from either side. It is it's such a fascinating industry, and uh, you know I, I'd love to hear more about your journey. Um, you know I know it's brought you to Australia, so that's that's yeah. an exciting part of the journey. Talk me through what was next for you in your in your recruitment. So um, so I, I progressed quite quickly to a team leader within I think I think it was about just over three years. I got an opportunity as a as a team leader, which is quite fast within recruitment obviously I had a lot of hand holding with it but you know I, I enjoyed that and I was still billing and then I went on to um, being a manager there and then moved on to a divisional manager at another company a smaller company which to be honest I really didn't like um extremely salesy too much you know even for me to the point where I felt like we were burning bridges and doing things the wrong way but also burning employees and not treating employees in the way that they should be internally as well mm. um so i was there and you know paid well it was a good enough job it was fine but it, it kind of burned me a little bit and i wasn't enjoying recruitment as much and that's when i found out about the opportunity of sponsorship in australia through recruitment um, australia is a place that i'd always wanted to come to i'd always you know um back from my early days I you know I didn't I suppose I didn't really believe that it was achievable but it's something that I would 
you know, I always wanted to immigrate. Um, so when I saw that opportunity, I, you know, I contacted a recruiter who specializes in that over here and went through the process and actually moved a lot quicker than I thought. And I was very lucky to have a family um, behind me that knew that it was what I wanted to do, including, you know, my mum, um, who pushed me and made me book the tickets, you know, because I probably would have got cold feet at some point, you know, but yeah. as much as they hated it for me, they weren't trying to get rid of me, I don't think, but um, as much <laughs> as I think they hated it, um, I think, you know, they could see that that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, having that influence behind me from there. And then I had friends who followed me out afterwards who kind of sent, I suppose it's easier when you know someone over here. Mm. So when I came over here and I got set up, set up, it was easier for them to then follow, you know, with that as well. So start to build amazing. a good Amazing. Yeah. So and then that. continued your career in agency recruitment over here? Yeah, yeah. So then I, I took a step back. I think um, it's pretty common over here that, you know, especially new markets, new area, that you, you go back into a recruitment role. You don't go back into a management role. Mm. Um, and so I worked for a company called, they were called Pharmaceutical and Medical Professionals at the time. They're now called HPG Group. Um, right. so they specialize in pharmaceutical and medical recruitment. Um, and they do a lot. They're still around now. They're still doing very, very well. And there's still a lot of people who I worked with who are actually still there. Um, that was actually in Macquarie Park, believe it or not. Um, but um, there was a good opportunity for me because they were building and establishing an engineering and IT market. So um, it was a good opportunity for me to be able to go in there, build relationships, leapfrog off some of the relationships they already had as a business and really um, create this other service offering that they didn't really have before within engineering and IT. So um, I was there for, what, three and a half years, I think, maybe. Great. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I went on to TRC, the recruitment company. Right. Where I was with for... Um, I was with them for six years. Wow, six years and some yeah. decent tenures going on there, mate. Like you're not you're not one of these recruiters that moves around every nine to twelve months, right? Like you and and is that something that was that was intentional? Like, did you in each of these yeah. roles want to learn something specific and develop your career in a certain in a certain way? Yeah, I think you know, I've always been I, like, I've always been cautious in accepting jobs in the fact that I want to make sure that they are right for me. Um, mm. And I've never been one to move around. I really believe that the opportunity is there. And um, there's openness to, you know, hear ideas and maybe perhaps broaden my skill set, work in different ways and learn things, then, you know, I'm happy. Um, and TRC was a great example of that. You know, mm. um, the recruitment company is by far the best company I've ever worked for, um, you know, for over six years. And we went on an incredible journey there as a leadership team um, where we everything was about culture. Everything yeah. was about, you yeah. know, um, how can we do things better? How can we retain staff better? Um, you know, um, how can we attract staff? But how can we give a better service to our, you know, our um, customers by doing that as well? And that taught me a huge amount. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's big stint there doing that. Kind fantastic, of stuff. fantastic. And then I know you're you're out on your own now. You've launched yeah. your own business. So yeah, tell me yeah. about that. that. I mean, that's that's wonderful. And firstly, congratulations. Thank um, you. Tell, tell me about your business. It. Yeah, well, time to do it. Just had a baby. I um, know. It's not as busy as it was, but um, there's never a right <laughs> time, right? And um, it, recruitment goes in cycles and you know it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time and I feel like I'm at that stage now um so you know with all the learnings and the teachings I think that I've had from my previous roles and growing markets and then the I suppose the contacts that I've got now within different areas it put me in a good position where um I was able to launch something but I wanted to launch something that I could grow I don't want to be a one-man band I don't want that I don't want it to be a lifestyle business. There's nothing wrong with lifestyle businesses. I've got friends that do it. Um, but I want to create a company that, you know, a, a sizable company that, that does things differently um, and adds genuine value. Um, so I've, um, although, so I'm, I've, I've started Talent Aligned, but we have um, two shareholders and investment partners who own a large recruitment company called Definitive Consulting. Right, okay. Um, Definitive Consulting is a worldwide exec search firm. 
that's been around for years and years. They're over here. They're in Dubai. They're in Asia. You know, Asia. They're in the UK. They're in the, in New York now. Um, so they're all over the place. So um, Gareth and Darren, who are the um, the owners of that business, um, they wanted to see value in other you, uh, recruitment markets, other people that they believe in, um, and fund them through the journey that they they want to do. So I've got full kind of creative rights with what I want to do I suppose within yeah. reason if I did anything too crazy then they'd probably be <laughs> doing. Yeah. but um but no I've got it's, it's my business it's what I want to do but they give me the funding the invest investment um the advice which is obviously needed um and create a little hub with a few other recruitment companies in other sectors which we can bounce ideas off each other as well um yeah so we're able to kind of grow something and you've got the community of other recruiters Community. behind you, right? And, that, and yes, that's, yes. that's really powerful. I, I really love that. Yeah. So what what are you most passionate about, Lee? Um, I'm passionate about, I suppose, service. Um, I, I think that... I think that recruiters, well, recruitment does have a bad name or it can have a bad name. There's still a big proportion of the industry which um, where the job is maybe seen as a stopgap um, an easy way to get a visa um, and service isn't or even a call center and, and service isn't forefront of mind forefront of mind is making money um, I believe that the true value and what I'm passionate about is that the true value in a good recruitment partner is that the ability to be able to consult with a business on a on a problem and find a solution for it so mm-hmm to really kind of diagnose what, what that um, company would be looking for and then go on a journey with them to be able to try and solve that problem rather than saying, here's a job description, find me some CVs. Mm. And I think along with that, um, I genuinely believe, and obviously this can't always be the case, but I think recruitment companies um, or recruiters in general sometimes come into the process too late. I think yes. that if the um, if you've got a good trusted recruitment partner with you who you know knows what they're talking about they should be in the in in the decision making at the forefront before the job description is made you know talking advising on things like skill sets that are available in the market um even gender diversity market demographics where's best to recruit um salary information all of that kind of stuff so that when the jd is there and it's made is something that's achievable and it actually fills the pain points of that client Mm. Um, and I suppose that's what I'm passionate about is not obviously we send CVs that's what we do but I think it's the whole solving a problem going on a journey um, with with that um, with that client and and solving a problem uh, an issue for them is is what's important and that's not unique to agency recruitment consultancy Mm. like I, I I have this conversation with people from my network that are working internally that that they come into the process too late yeah. And, yeah. and they're within an organisation and they're not having those conversations around position yeah. design, um, role relativity, uh, rem and bends and how, yeah. to, how to actually, you know, influence the business, whether that be the HR business partnering unit or the actual yeah. you know, business unit or the hiring manager or executive in terms mm-hmm. of what this role needs to look like and how it should be crafted. And, yeah. and I think that's actually a, a, a lesson that I learned earlier on in my career because both in agency and internal, I would take that job description, then go and get a brief. But I've learned over the years that I need to actually be there much, much earlier than that. I need to be having those conversations when the role doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. And I think, I I think that most hiring managers um, or most people hiring for positions would probably prefer that as well. But I think the reason that it doesn't happen as much is because it hasn't happened before and probably trust as well. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, ultimately, the, you know, building trust within the recruitment industry when it has had such a bad name over the years, you know, is something that's more difficult to do. And like what I'm quite passionate about with this business is I want to kind of bridge the gap between recruitment consultant and consultancy. I want to be more of a conduit between the business and, you know, the market. The other thing as well, I think that, um, and this is just talking about that early stage as well, is like, I suppose if you're not in those early conversations, you don't talk about things like how's best to market this role? You know, how, exactly. do, we sell, how do we sell this role to to potential candidates? And I think 
you know, what isn't thought about a lot is that if you put a role out there and you don't know how to sell it properly or you're working with a recruiter and they don't know how to sell your position or your business, then they pick up the phone and the candidate goes, no, it's very difficult then to turn that no back into a yes, probably ever, because the damage has already been done to the brand. You know, so I think there's a lot more in that consultancy piece, which can be added, um, which can add far more value than just sending a few CVs, which is what, you know, is probably more known from a recruitment partner. Yeah, I love it. And I really relate to it, Lee. I mean, there's so much talk in the internal talent acquisition industry about a shifting to becoming talent advisors to the businesses That's that it. we present. But yep. Hear that agencies are also adopting that mindset and adopting that yep. philosophy to be yep. talent advisors to their clients. Yeah, is amazing because that just lifts our reputation as an industry more holistically. Yep. So that's actually Lee. It's music to my ears to hear that, <laughs> and and it excites me. So again, congrats on the business. I think I think it's fabulous what you're doing. Yeah, thanks, thanks, and I think you know that that plus having some educational background in technology and working in it for a while puts me in a unique spot because there isn't many recruiters out there who actually have some sort of technical background, you know, Mm. you know, so what I'm hoping with this and, you know, what I know from this is that when I, you know, built when I've built partnerships, good partnerships with businesses, I'll be able to add a lot more value. Mm. Um, And with growing and, uh, you know, we are growing the business fairly soon. So first half in October, second in January, um, and then from there outwards. So it's going to grow pretty quick. Um, one of the things that I'm hugely passionate about and that won't change is I've put aside a big budget for training um, for each of these consultants that comes into the business. And I want people who are passionate about technology and actually want to be trained in the markets that they're working on. So, for example, if they're a project services recruiter and they're recruiting project managers, then why why not do a Prince 2 qualification? They should be able to yeah. understand that enough. Obviously, be very good at the consultant part and the recruitment part, but they should be able to talk the talk within it rather than saying they're a technical recruitment specialist because they've been on a market for two years, Mm. you know. Mm. Um, And I think that's a real value add as well. You know, if I can do that and bridge that gap between recruitment consultant and consultancy um, and value partner, trusted partner, I think that's that's an area where um, we want to be. And I'd love to see more of the recruitment industry move into more of that, that kind of space in the future. Me too. Absolutely. Well, finally, we are out of time. What what advice would you give to anyone out there who's um, considering a career in recruitment or maybe already working in recruitment? Final piece of advice, Lee? Um, I suppose remember that you're dealing with people. I think it gets yeah. forgotten about a, a lot because we go through this process so many times a week that we kind of become immune to it. But a lot of the people that we're dealing with probably will go through this process once in three or five years. They do need hand-holding it's far easier for anyone to stay in a position than it is to leave because ultimately, you know, they it's where they spend most of their time. They've got all their friends there. It's where they eat lunch, it's where they go to the gym. You know, it's a, it's a big move. It changes every aspect of their life when they're changing jobs. So I think remember that you're dealing with people. Make sure that you get back to people if you say you're going to get back to them and hold their hand, you know, and make their process enjoyable all the way through and then you will change people's lives. Um, and people will then come back to you and, use you again so fabulous lee thank you so much for joining me today for the rubber band podcast and listeners um lee marjoram on linkedin connect in with him and follow talent aligned you're doing amazing work thank you so thank much you. Lee. it's been an thank absolute so delight catching up cheers thanks thanks mate